Hi everyone, my name is Taylor Dempsey and I'm a student assistant here at the International House and a rising junior at UT. Today, I will be giving a brief introduction into the US classroom for all of you. The United States education system and methods are very different from other countries around the world. So I think that knowing some of these similarities and differences can really help you be prepared for classes and for the semester. So we have a brief presentation here uh, with some slides and I really hope that it is helpful. So the first thing I wanted to go over and review is an overview of the United States education system. So think about the education system where you're from and compare it to the blue category, which is labeled non-US education system up at the top. This chart shows uh, a really brief summary and generalization of some of the main differences between the US education system and a lot of other countries. So your home country might be similar to the blue category. I will go over the red and talk about some of these differences uh, just so we can focus in on the United States. So first of all, our schools are both centralized and decentralized at the same time. So our central government and our federal government does have some control over our education system, but they do not have co total control. Our states, counties, and cities have control and have influence in our schools as well. So it is not just the central government that decides how and when we go to school. More on that, uh, that department in the federal government is called the U.S. Department of Education. And like I mentioned earlier, they influence schools, but they do not govern them. So there's no hierarchy from the federal government down. It's kind of more like a give and take and different municipalities do different things. Next, here in the United States, there's a lot of flexibility for the individual student. So rather than every student following the same path and taking the same classes, we have a lot of flexibility regarding what, su what subjects we take um, and when we take them. So you're not on any sort of fixed path. Next is about our admissions tests. So admissions tests in the United States are designed, written, and scored by private organizations. So for example, the test to get into university here in the United States, you can take either um, the ACT or the SAT for that. And both of those are designed and scored by private organizations rather than our government. And the standards by which you need to score are different among different universities and different schools. Next, our faculty is privately hired. And this hiring is very competitive and focused on teaching skill, publications, and research. So especially at UT, we are an R1 institution or a Research 1 institution, which means that we have a heavy, heavy focus on research. So when searching for professors or faculty, a lot of the emphasis goes on these deliverables and what they have published and what research they do rather than their knowledge and experience or um, centrally recruited credentials that the government administers. Next is that we have sort of two different types of schools. We have public schools that are heavily funded by the federal and state government and private schools that are funded through tuition, endowments, and gifts. So the University of Tennessee is a public school, so most of our funding comes from the federal and state government rather than through tuition, endowments, and gifts as some other private schools um, in the state and in the country. So the next thing I wanted to go over are some common terms that we use here in the United States. There's a lot of lingo or special vocabulary that we use when talking about our classes or our experience at university. So I thought these might be helpful. So the first is vol mail, which is your assigned UT email. When you enroll at the university, they will help you set this up either through Google or a different platform. And it's what we use as our main form of communication between each other as students, professors, or any other faculty. Next is the GA, which is a graduate assistant or someone who's working at the university while also studying for their graduate degree. So we have some GAs here at the International House and a lot of other offices on campus employ them. Next is the TA, which is the teaching assistant. And this is someone who helps the professor or the teacher. And this is generally a student and you'll probably see these in a lot of your science classes or math classes. Next is this little abbreviation, MTWRF or MWF or TR. And this is when we talk about when our classes meet. So these stand for the days of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday. So your classes will generally meet on one of these three schedules. And it's what you should see in your MyUTK um, under each one of your classes. 
Next is add drop. So this is how we talk about how we take our classes. So when you take another class, you are essentially adding that class to your schedule. And if you leave that class, you are dropping that class. There are a lot of specific rules for when and how you can drop a class and the implications of each one. So make sure you check with the university and with your professors about these rules. Next is OIT, which is the Office of Information Technology. And this is the office on campus that can help you with any of your technology needs. Uh, one time my computer broke and I had to go in there and they fixed it all up. I had some sort of virus or something, um, but they can really handle anything. They have an office in the library and you can also call and chat with them. We also have office hours, office hours here in the United States. And this is where you can go and speak to your professor about really anything. The times and dates of these hours will be on your syllabus, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but really utilize these hours as a time to ask questions or learn more about your professor. Next is my UTK, which is your hub for all of your UT information. This is where you register for classes, where you pay your bills, where you request a transcript. So if you normally have any questions about UT or about your specific program, you can go on your My UTK profile and find a lot of information. Next is Canvas, which is the hub for all of our schoolwork. So this is where your professor will keep up with your assignments and your homework and um, will keep your class organized online. Then we have the syllabus, which is an outline of all of the subjects in a course. And we'll go over the syllabus a little bit more in um, a minute, but the syllabus is kind of your go-to for each class. So this will have your professor's information, um, details about the class, what you need, and all of this stuff. Next are these terms, freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior. And these are how we talk about our our years we've been at the university as an undergraduate student. So I'm a junior at the university, which means I've been here for three years. And this is normally done on credit hours. So 30 credit hours means that you are a freshman or below 30 credit hours. 30 to 60 means you're a sophomore and so on. So these terms normally um, are pretty loose. So you may not fall into one specific category. You may have been here for three years, but have 120 hours, um, it kind of depends, but these are loose terms for the amount of years we've been at the university. Next is your advisor who is who helps you stay on track to graduate. So you'll be assigned an advisor depending on your college and depending on your major, and they really help you pick which classes to take and make sure you stay on track. Then we have audit, which means you enroll in a class for no credit. So you still pay for the class, but you do not get a grade and you do not get credit for it. And this credit or these credit hours is how you get recognition for taking a class. So you need a certain number to graduate. Um, that's what we talk about when we say this class is three credit hours. That means that's three more hours that gets you to that graduation number. And finally, we have your transcript, which is just your record of your grades, and you can request these on your My UTK Pro. Okay, so now we are gonna go over some classroom etiquette or what to do and what not to do in the classroom. So this specific slide is about your professors um, who we tend to have a pretty formal relationship with here in the United States. So first, do not rise when a professor enters. Normally, when I, whenever the professor comes into the room, you should be seated. When you address them, you should refer to them in the way that they ask you to. Normally on the first day of school, they'll tell you what they prefer, but the most common terms are normally doctor or professor, depending on their level of education. And like I said earlier, what they prefer. There are also a lot of different levels of professor here at the University of Tennessee. So we have full professors, assistant professors, adjunct professors, and GTAs or graduate teaching assistants. So these levels, depend on how long a professor has been here, their level of publication, their research, and all of these things. Um, but your professor will normally tell you which of these they are. Next, whenever you start a class on the first day of school, they'll normally call out everyone's name in the class, if it's a smaller class, in order to make sure everyone's in the right spot and make sure everyone <clears throat> knows where they are. So it is okay to help them pronounce your name. 
And even if they don't go over the role or don't go over everyone's names like this, if you're speaking to them personally, it's okay to help them pronounce your name. Next is dress code. So we tend to have a pretty relaxed dress code, but this does not mean relaxed standard standards. You can generally wear what you want to class, but you're still expected to pay attention and treat your relationship with your professor as if it's something professional and more formal than a friend. Professors also generally value participation in speaking in class and they want to hear your opinion. So we'll go over why this is in a little bit, but professors tend to ask questions and create a discussion in the classroom. So they want to hear what you're thinking and what you have questions about. Next is the classroom etiquette in between students and as a student. So like I mentioned before, student clothing vary, varies. People generally don't wear pajamas, but almost anything else is okay as long as it's appropriate and it will not offend anyone around you. Eating in class is also something that's a little tricky. Your professor may have specific rules about this, but generally small snacks are okay. Um, you can have water or drinks in the class, but what you can eat is oftentimes up to your professor, but we normally don't eat full meals or um, anything like this out on our desks. Technology use is very common, so ask your professor for the specific rules about that. A lot of students take notes on their computer or on um, a tablet or anything like this, so it definitely varies from class to class. Um, like I said, a lot of us take notes, so you can do that with technology or without, with a pen and paper, um, but you will generally see your classmates taking notes. Next is to not use outside websites. So this can get into the realm of cheating, which I'm sure you're familiar with. So do not use outside websites to give you answers for your homework or anything like this that is considered cheating. And um, that information may not be what your professor wants you to know. And finally is about audio recording. So some students prefer to record their professor's lectures and then re-listen to them later in order to make sure that they um, got all of the relevant information or anything like this. And this is okay normally, but you have to ask your professor first. So you have to ask your professor if you can record them and then they will decide how you can proceed from there. All right, so next we're gonna go over the course structure. And the main place to find information about your course structure is your syllabus. And we have a sample syllabus right here to the right that you can reference. So your syllabus kind of gives you an overview of everything you need to know about a class. It has the basic information, such as the name and email of your professor that you can see up at the top, as well as the office and the um, office hours that that professor holds. So here it says they are available by appointment, which means you'd have to email them in order to set up office hours. Then it has a course description or course overview, which kind of tells you briefly what the class is about and what you can expect. Then it normally has materials requirements, which means what you will be graded on and what you will be tested on. So exams, quizzes, assignments, anything like that, and how they are weighted in the class. So which one is more important to your grade and which is less important to your grade. It should also have the policies. So the grading procedures, um, which numbers correspond to which letter grade, their policies on attendance and participation and anything else. It will also generally have a schedule or a tentative calendar of topics and readings, exam dates, the last day to drop a class, anything like this. So normally at the beginning of a semester, I go through the schedule on my syllabus and put it all in my personal calendar so I can stay up to date with what's going on in class and stay on the track the professor designed. Then it also generally has resources, so tips for success, glossaries, links, academic support services. Um, they can point you into the correct place for tutoring, anything like this. Um, so this is normally really helpful. Then all UT syllabuses or syllabi will have a statement on accommodation, which means if you have a disability, you can get special assistance for the class. Um, the professor will work with you and help make sure that you are successful in that class. And finally is the evaluation of the course rights. So it goes over your rights as a student and the rights of your instructor um, regarding your relationship and regarding how you interact in the class. 
So this is generally what is on a syllabus. There could be other information, um, like it will have the required text, as you can see on this, this document right here, which means which textbooks you need to buy or just anything else. This is kind of what your professor wants you to know at the beginning of class, at the beginning of the semester regarding the rest of your time in that class. So here are some other parts of the course structure in the United States. So we have lecture, discussion, or lab. So these are kind of the different um, methods or formats your classes can take. So a lecture is when your professor is just speaking to you as a student. Discussion is when they're asking questions, even though they may know the answer and multiple people answer and create a discussion. So in order to ask those questions or answer them, you generally raise your hand and the professor will call on you. You can also have lab, which means you're in a lab doing some sort of experiment or learning about something in a more hands-on way. So your syllabus will tell you which of these um, your class uses or your professor uses, and you can generally also find this information on my UTK. Next is the way our homework works. So you can have a lot of different assignments for your homework. You can do readings from a textbook. You can have assignments on our Canvas site, which like I mentioned earlier, is the place where all of the information about your class should be. And your professor can also assign you to be in a small group or team in order to create some sort of project or some sort of paper or anything like that. So all of these can count as homework and your professor will tell you what you have. I wanted to go over the pedagogical approach to teaching in the United States and show how it is different. I think this shows a lot about how our classrooms run and what you can expect in the class and what you can expect from the course structure. So in many places around the world, they have a teacher-centered pedagogy, which means that the teacher or professor lectures, there's very little participation, and the instructors evaluate students. So as you can see here, it's kind of a hierarchy from the professor down. But here in the United States, we use a more learner-centered pedagogy, which is where we have lectures and discussions in groups and as a class. And in class, we try to apply the theory that our professors are teaching us. So we ask questions and we participate in class, and we also have the opportunity to evaluate our professors. So at the end of a semester, the university will send out evaluations, and you can fill those out to give your professor feedback about their teaching style or anything like that. And I think knowing that difference really helps you understand how our classrooms run. Um, they're very participatory generally, and we're really trying to create discussions, and there's less hierarchy than in a lot of other places. And the last part of course structure I wanted to go over is our assessments. So this is not a complete list, but this is some um, generalizations and some information about how our assessments work. So many times they are cumulative, which means they cover everything. So the, the content builds on each other and you are tested on all of it. Our exams can be in many formats. They can be multiple choice, so you choose A, B, C, or D. They can be short answer, where you write a few sentences, or they can be essay, where you're expected to write longer answers and explanations to questions. You can also be asked to turn in papers and essays or lab reports to show that you understand the material, and this is a very, um, very, very common form of assessment. So in the United States, professors really, really like direct and clear writing. So they don't tend to like um, what's often called fluff or a lot of extra words. But we can also have oral presentations and group projects. So these are other forms of assessment um, or you're asked to stand in front of the class and speak about something or asked to work with a group of other students in order to create um, an, end, uh, an end project. And finally, you can be assessed on your participation in class or your attendance. So your professor may have a requirement that tells you you must participate once a class or you can only miss three classes per semester. So make sure you check your syllabus for that information and for which specific assessments your professor will use in order to determine your grade. Next, I wanted to go over technology use. So technology use varies widely in the United States and it is always changing. So from COVID-19, uh, we have changed a lot of the way we use technology in the classroom. So this information on this slide and what I'm talking about may change at any minute. 
But as of now, the university is offering four different um, methods of and uses of technology in our classroom. So we have face-to-face -face classes, which is where no technology is used and you are in class with your professor in person. We have hybrid, which means that some of your class is face-to-face -face and some of your class is online using technology. We have online as shown, which means that your class is done through Zoom or a Zoom lecture where you are on your computer and you are speaking to your professor through technology. We also have online flex classes, which means that all of the information is either pre-recorded or assessments are pre-uploaded into your Canvas site and your professor expects complete reliance on technology in order to complete the class. So like I said, these can um, change in the future and they may be different by the time you're hearing this, but these are what the university is using right now. So in class, we also use technology in a lot of different ways. And the first of those is with clickers. So sometimes during class, a professor will ask um, all of the students a question and you will use your clicker in order to answer that question. We have physical clickers or there is an app that you can download on your phone that your professor can help you um, can help you download. But these clickers are used to gauge the student's understanding of a topic or sometimes to take attendance. So for some classes, this is a really important piece of technology. I also mentioned earlier that note taking takes many different forms in the classroom and technology is often used um, to do so. So students take, take notes on Google Docs, OneNote, Word, or a lot of other computer or tablet extensions or programs or websites. But you can also take notes on your pen and paper with a notepad. Either is generally okay, just make sure your professor is okay with that technology use. And finally, we use technology a lot in our communication. I mentioned vol mail and Canvas before, but this is where a lot of that um, information flow comes from, from your professor and from the university. So make sure you continuously check those. Next, I wanted to go over some of the general university rules. So you can find the comprehensive list of rules on the internet. Um, it's very easy to find, but these are some of the most important in my mind. So attendance, so how often you need to come to class, these rules are set by your professor, not the university. So like I mentioned, they should be in your syllabus, but make sure you find these out on the first day of class. You also can be dropped from a class if you miss the first meeting. So make sure you show up to all of your classes on the first day of school. And if you don't, your professor has the right to drop you from that class and you will no longer be able to take it. Uh, so this is really, really important. Next is the grading system. So grading systems also sometimes vary between professors, but these are some of the um, most important ones. So this top list from A to a C is what is considered passing. We don't have A pluses here at the University of Tennessee, but we do have plus and minuses for the other letters. And then from a C minus to an F is not passing or unsatisfactory, and this means you will not receive credit for a class. And finally, we have satisfactory or no credit, which means that you don't receive a letter grade, you just either pass or you do not receive credit for the class. There are a few other grading systems, but these are kind of the most common and your professor will also tell you about this on that first day and in the syllabus. And next is a really, really important one, plagiarism. So plagiarism is when you use someone else's words, ideas, thoughts, results, etc., without giving them credit. And this is taken very seriously in the United States. Even if you don't do it intentionally, you can still get in trouble for it. And it's considered academic dishonesty. If you're caught doing this, you can be uh, suspended from the university. You can receive no credit or an F in your class. And you're honestly in a lot of trouble. So you must cite your sources in the format your professor wants, whether that's MLA or APA um, or any other format. There's a lot of these and your professor will ask you for a specific one. This is the UT Code of Conduct, a brief, um, a brief paragraph from that. And this is more information about plagiarism. So I thought it was really, really important to go over this. So I wanted to show you exactly what the university considers plagiarism. So using without proper documentation, written or spoken words, phrases, or sentences from any source. So this means you cannot take words from another 
textbook, another academic journal, another article without using the proper documentation, so quotation marks and citation methods. You can Google these depending on the format your professor wants. Next is summarizing without proper documentation ideas from another source. So even if you get an idea or you summarize some information from a textbook or from an academic article and you do not say that that summary came from that article, that is still considered plagiarism. Next is borrowing facts, statistics, graphs, pictorial representation, or phrases without acknowledging the source. Once again, you have to show where you get your information. Next is collaborating on a graded assignment without the instructor's approval, so you cannot collaborate with your fellow students if your professor does not allow it. And finally, submitting work either in whole or partially created by a professional service or used without attribution. So you cannot use um, services that will pay you or that will um, allow you to pay them to write an essay for you or anything like this. All of these are considered plagiarism and are are considered plagiarism and are taken very serious, seriously from the university. So if you have any questions about this, you can ask your professor, um, but make sure you cite your sources and you don't use anyone's work without proper documentation. And finally, I wanted to go over some tips for success. Um, all of this information can be very overwhelming and very confusing, and sometimes it feels like you don't really know where to start. So we've compiled some tips for success here, as well as some tips and advice from other students. So the first tip is to prioritize. Um, make sure you have a running list or an idea of what needs to get done first, and you don't try to spend the same amount of time on every assignment. Some assignments are more important than others, and you need to make sure you're using your time wisely. Another general idea or tip is to study two hours per credit. So if you have a three credit hour course, you need to be studying six hours per week. So this can kind of help you gauge how much time you should be spending on each class outside of the classroom. Next tip is to participate in class and talk to your professor if you're having trouble. We went over those approaches to teaching and the differences between the United States and other systems. And I think that shows that class is really participatory and your professors want to hear your questions. So if you have these questions, ask them, ask your fellow classmates and participate in class to make sure you fully understand the material. Go to your professor's office hours as well. Remember, you can find these on the syllabus. You may have to request them by appointment, but generally there are specific times and dates throughout the semester. You can go to these office hours to clarify concepts, ask them questions in a more personal setting. You can give them information about personal problems of why you're having trouble succeeding in the classroom. You can ask them for career advice, and it's even common to be casual and talk about your personal life or your hobbies. Your professors want to get to know you, and they want to hear from you about the class and what you're having trouble with. So using these office hours is a really, really good way to make sure you have your questions answered, make sure you learn more about your professor, and learn more about yourself. You can learn about their research and what they're doing, and see where you fit into those equations. Um, like I said, your professors want to have a relationship with you and they can generally help you out um, and give you more information about their research or anything like this. Use a calendar. So I use Google Calendar, but there's a lot of other online calendar systems as well as paper and pencil calendars or um, agendas like that. So, you know, write all of the information from your syllabus in a calendar to make sure you stay on track in the course. The university also offers supplemental instruction and tutoring for classes like chemistry and math and a lot of other classes. You can find a lot of this information on the Student Success Center's website and from your professor, so use those office hours to ask these questions. Tutoring is also offered at the Multicultural Student Life or from Multicultural Student Life, and you can go on their website to find out more about that. And the Writing Center also offers help for writing essays or papers, um, and they're located in the library. Another good tip is to create study groups with American students. Uh, these students generally know what to expect, so if you have questions, they can answer them. And it's really helpful to get feedback from other students about what you understand and what you don't understand. Another tip is to have patience. 
Um, semesters are long and sometimes it's hard to get all of your work done. So make sure you have patience with yourself and with your classmates and with your professor and trust that you can get everything done and you can complete the class in the way your professor intended. And finally, the last tip is to use programs like Quizlet or Rate My Professor. Quizlet is an online flashcard service, so you can create flashcards through the internet, or Rate My Professor is used to give you more information about your professors. There's a lot of programs and websites like this that can help you um, create more efficient study methods or help you learn more about the content without cheating. So make sure you ask your fellow classmates about those and do some Googling to find the ones that work for you. And finally, we have advice from previous international students. So these are just a few more pieces of, of advice that may help you succeed at the university. So this one says, once you're in the United States, find someone to show you the ropes. So like I mentioned earlier about study groups with American students, having a US um, student can really help you adjust to the education system and to Knoxville in general. So I highly recommend trying to find some friends or other students in your program to help you learn more about the university and what you're doing here. The next tip from a student is to be independent. In the United States, you will likely not get as much help as you're used to. You're required to figure things out for yourself, to learn by doing. So like I said earlier, also Google these programs to find out which study methods work for you, utilize the resources the university offers, check out the Center for um, Academic Success, and Ask people around you about for tips. You have to do what works for you and what will help you be successful. And you have to figure those out on your own. You will not have someone um, helping you along the way to figure this out. If you do need help, you can always reach out to a lot of different offices on campus and people will help you. But you are expected to kind of try things on your own and figure out what you enjoy. And next is everyone has similar experiences. It's normal to go through ups and downs when you first arrive. Talk to other students who are going through the same thing, you will get through it. Being an international student is not easy and there's a lot of cultural shock and confusion that comes from this. So spend time with other international students as well. Um, there's always time at the international house that you can come and spend hanging out and just know that everyone else is, is having issues too. No one's process throughout college, whether you're an American student or an international student is easy. So just know that you are not alone and that everyone else has problems and messes up too. So that is the end of this presentation. Um, I hope it was helpful. If you would like any more information, once again, you can ask anyone at the International House and they would be very happy to help you. And you can also check out some of those offices um, that we talked about at UT. So the Student Success Center is really, really helpful academically. We also have a counseling center on help campus that can help you with any mental health or personal problems. We have multicultural student life centers, um, anything like this. So if you're looking for it, Google it and you can for sure find some sort of help or some sort of information. Once again, I hope this was helpful and good luck.